So finally, to wrap up chapter 14, we're going to look into sort of basic principles that underlie gene regulatory networks. The main comment being is it's really complicated. <laughs> it's all different by organism, by whatever cell type you're looking at. It's, um, yeah, there's a lot of research meat in this particular uh, topic and there's a lot of different um, projects going on trying to determine how exactly who where what why what genes are involved in a lot of different processes and many different organisms so for example uh, we talked about eat4 previously about how it has multiple different um, transcription factor sites before its um, main coding region so this is uh, the cis regulatory modules we have multiple cis regulatory modules and multiple transcription factors that are acting on each of them okay and so if we look at just one of those transcription factors like lin 11 okay uh it doesn't only affect the transcription of eat4 it affects a bunch of other genes too okay. it actually regulates at least 11 other genes and um so these genes, these 11 genes, have their expression coordinated because the same transcription factor is affecting all of them, okay? So you get this sort of broad um, regulation effect of one gene, uh, this LIN11, which LIN11 is coded by its own uh, gene, right? Um, affecting a bunch of different other processes along the way. One of the ways we find out what transcription factors go with what genes and what they're doing is this uh, chromatin immunoprecipitation assay, which is a big word for like, we grab the DNA, the transcription factors attached to, and then we sequence it, okay? So you um, grab the chromatin that has the transcription factors bound, uh, you fragment that, you get a specific antibody to that transcription factor so that you can drag it away, right? And then you can extract the DNA from that complex, sequence it, and map to genome. So what, where exactly was that transcription factor doing things, okay? Um, and so it's pretty, uh, you need to have an antibody that would match to the transcription factor you're looking for, and um, it gets pretty precise and then but the payoff is that you found, have this little piece of DNA which you can then map to the genome and find out um, all the different places where that transcription factor was actually latching on at that time. So some transcription factors regulate many genes. By regulate we mean that transcription factor binds at the cis regulatory module and helps control the transcription of that gene. Okay. Some transcription factors only regulate a few genes, okay? And each of those target genes could be straight up it codes for a protein, or it could be another transcription factor that modifies something else further down the line, okay? And so cells are expressing different transcription factors. So not all of these target proteins are going to be transcribed in every cell, okay? So you can get this hierarchy building up. Each circle here is a known transcription factor in fruit flies, Drosophilia. So the top ones, uh, sort of, are this middle one we've got um, here, Monk. This KR affects a lot of different transcription factors on different, say, levels. Okay. Uh, so they will all, a lot of these will interact with each other and regulate. Um, each other and it's this sort of cascading effect but if this one here sort of this key major one goes off then you're going to see a lot of stuff sort of cascading down the pathway in opposition to the like never-ending cascade we have what's called auto regulation okay, where the transcription factor protein encoded by a gene binds to the regulatory region of its own gene so it controls its own expression okay and caudal is a good example of this um, where the mRNA is transcribed by the mother and deposited into the ovum, the egg cell, and is then trans just that mRNA is in the ovum, and then it's translated into a protein uh, upon fertilization, and then it binds to its own regulatory region in the embryo, which triggers its own transcription and translation within the embryo, and then that activates transcription of 40 other genes that are all required post-fertilization. Okay. 
So a very small amount of caudal mRNA um, results in higher expression in the embryo and then starts off like this um, cascade of many other genes. Okay. So we've got two different types of autoregulation, which is um, the first one, like we saw, is called amplifier, okay, where you have a low level of transcription that produces an autoactivator and then binds to itself to stimulate more transcription, like caudal. Okay. So you just get more and more and more gene product over time. And then the second stage is called a pulse generator, where um, there's an initial response, you get some transcription, but then you produce an autorepressor that then binds to block transcription. So you get this sort of whoop, some out, and then it starts binding back on itself and slowing itself down, and then you get the um, repression at the end. So we can have um, those two different types of autoregulation, either amplification or pulse generation, and those either use an autoactivator or an autorepressor. Okay. Effector genes are the proteins that do things. Um, so, you know, do you, has a specific function. It's a phenotype of the cell. So enzymes, structural proteins, transport proteins, all those things. Uh, and then so processes that require an immediate response have short little paths. Okay. To the targets. There's not a lot of coordination among the transcription factors. Um, so like if you've got stress response or DNA damage and you need to react quickly, um, it's a pretty short pathway. You know, go pull the fire alarm, right? Something that occurs at specific times uh, needs a lot more controlled regulation. There's many interactions among the transcription factors. There's relatively few targets. Um, so things like cell cycle control or sporulation, when certain things need to happen at a certain time, uh, have a much broader network with a lot of um, interactions between the points. Okay. And so you end up having these tiers of transcription factors where you start with like the master regulatory genes that trickle down, I know, trickle down. Um, to lower levels, but that tends to be, um, you know, uh, the, the further away you are from the effector genes, the more of a broad general response you have, and the closer up you, um, you are to the effector genes, the more of an immediate reaction you need. So up top you have the major effects on organization of body plan, like the Hox genes, but then lower down the hierarchy you just have um, affecting one or two specific processes uh, when triggered. Okay. Here's C. elegans, the nematode, where we can watch every gene, and uh, every cell in the body being um, tracked along through development, which is pretty cool. And so you can, um, they've been putting together these master um, transcription factors here. So MAB5 um, is one of them. So there's sort of this in-out, um, in-between graph here of, of the interactions between the various uh, transcription factors, which I will not test you on exactly which ones are which. That would be super evil. But just knowing there's this interactivity here. Okay. And that microRNAs start playing a part here too, and that microRNAs uh, also have this hierarchy of regulation. And for example, there are at least 11 microRNAs that target that MAB5. And so as we recall, microRNAs float around and bind to other mRNAs. Then, then they block translation of those mRNA. They tag it for degradation. So what they're doing is they're interrupting, they're blocking um, transcription, uh, translation of uh, other RNAs that are floating around. And so this is also a hot research topic. What exactly, which microRNAs are targeting which transcription factors and then the feedback loops there. So if this sounds exciting to you, go for it. There's a lot of grant funding out there for finding out transcription uh, factor hierarchies and gene regulation in general. But, all right, I think that's it for chapter 14. I will see you next week.